Jeremiah's 52 Magoo. We are here. The last chapter of Jeremiah. Thank you guys so much for joining me. I'm sorry with my voice. I'm utterly exhausted. I had a really long day, but there is only one chapter left and I just really want to do it and just complete the work that God gave me. And um, I have so enjo enjoyed this study. And I thought maybe about what to do next. Um, you know, this does lead into Lamentations, which was also written by Jeremiah. I thought about possibly going into that. And at first I was like, I don't, it's, you know, it's a very short book. It's just five chapters. And there are some amazing, hopeful points in it. Um, but it's very depressing. And... Jeremiah was an amazing man of God who suffered horridly when he didn't do anything wrong. Um, and as time went by and I really thought about it, there's a lot of ways that I connect with Jeremiah in different situations. And um, the more I thought about it, I started just kind of on my audio Bible. Um, I was, as I was going over Jeremiah and listening to it kind of keep it fresh in my mind it went on to lamentations after jeremiah ended and just listening to it it's like um he deserves to be heard and his voice um deserves to be heard and what he went through and i think that um it would do it would just be an injustice to not include those words of jeremiah because he has a right to be heard and also it helps us to see that, you know, the genuineness of a man who was authentic in his faith and still struggled with things and still wrestled with God sometimes and still just struggled and just completely, utterly fell apart, broken, beyond broken. And he was still saved. There's so many things out there, ideas and lies that um, you can never question God and you can never get discouraged or you can never have depression or just these crazy things that are nowhere to be found in scripture. I don't know where people came up with them. Um, a lifestyle that not even Jesus kept. Jesus got discouraged. Um, Jesus wanted to quit and give up. Jesus felt so much pain and pressure and the weight and the toll of everything that he just wanted to die. And he knows what that's like. And so I think it would just be our due diligence to give this voice to Jeremiah and move on to Lamentations once this is done and um, really let his voice be heard and dig deep and see that you can fall apart and still be saved. And God doesn't rebuke you. And, you know, this whole concept, faith and fear cannot coexist. Yeah, they did all the time. Like, are you, you, you are lying to yourself. If you say that you never doubt, you're, you're, you are a liar. And the truth is not in you. Everybody has weak moments. Everybody has down times. And that is a part of humanity. So with that being said, we're going to ask God's presence to come and join us. And then we are going to dive into the very last chapter of Jeremiah 52. Lord God, you are amazing. You brought us all this way. And I just invite your presence here with us that you would come and be with us and watch over us. Help us open our hearts and our minds that we can receive what you have for us today. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king. He reigned 11 years in Jerusalem and his mother's name was Hamuto, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. So it was a different Jeremiah. And he did that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that Jehoiakim had done. So if you remember, 
Zedekiah, we just learned in verse 1, was 21 when he became king. Nebuchadnezzar made him king when he came the first time and invaded Judah and took it over. Verse 3, for through the anger of the Lord, it came to pass in Jerusalem and Judah till he had cast them out from his presence that Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. So the king of Babylon makes him king and he rebels against the king who made him to be king. It's really crazy. Verse 4, and it came to pass in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, in the tenth day of the month, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came, he and all his army, against Jerusalem, pitched against it, and built fort, uh, forts against it all around. So the city was besieged all the way to the eleventh year of King Zedekiah. So it started off in towards the end of the ninth year, so a little over a year it was surrounded. Verse 6, and in the fourth month, in the ninth month, ninth day of the month, the famine was great in the city so that there was no bread for the people of the land. Then was the city broken down and all the men of war ran and went forth out of the city at night between the gates of the two walls that was by the king's gate. Now the Chaldeans were by the city all around. And they went, when the people fled, they went out into the plain. But the army of the Chaldeans chased after the king and caught him in the plains of Jericho. And his army was scattered from him. Kind of um, reminds me of um, smite the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. Verse 9, then they took the king and carried him up to the king of Babylon to Riblah in the land of Hamath, where he gave judgment upon him. So you can see um, it's going to touch a little bit on this. It's kind of like a little summary towards um, the, the ending in the fall, um, the second time also of Judah. Um, but it, it's going to end up giving us a little bit more history. So, so they, they caught the king, took him up to Hamath. And pronounced judgment on him. Verse 10. King, the king of Babylon killed the sons of Zedekiah in front of him. And also killed the princes of Judah there in Riblah. Then he took out the eyes of Zedekiah. And the king of Babylon bound him in chains and carried him to Babylon. Put him in prison till the day he died. So here's the crazy thing that despite the brutal things that were done to him, that he was forced to watch the death of his sons, they cut out his eyes and they stuck him in prison. As evil as he was, Zedekiah was, that's why all this stuff was done to him. As evil and rebellious as he was against God and everything else and would not change, would not repent, would not turn, God still kept his promise to him because we had read earlier in Jeremiah that God made him a promise that he would not be killed with the sword. And he wasn't like, and that's so crazy because you killed everybody else, but you knew that it was God. It was God, something in um, Nebuchadnezzar that God put there to not kill Zedekiah because God made him that promise. And despite Zedekiah, being and not caring about God, not caring about anything God said, not caring about how much he broke God's heart. God still kept his word to him. That's crazy. So verse 12, now in the fifth month, in the 10th day of the month, which was the 19th year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard who served Nebuchadnezzar, came to Jerusalem. He burned the house of the Lord. There was no reason to do that. He burned the house of the Lord and the king's palace, all the houses of Jerusalem, all the houses of the great men he burned with fire. And the army of the Chaldeans that were with the captain of the guard busted down the walls of Jerusalem all around. 
And Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried away captive certain of the poor of the people and the residue of the people that remained in the city, those that fell away, that surrendered to the king of Babylon and the rest of the multitude. So in here we see, hallelujah, that God always has a remnant. And even though all these people were carried away because the bulk of them were rebellious, we see that there were, there were other people like Jeremiah who weren't rebelling against the Lord. Because all that time, Jeremiah kept telling them, if you surrender and you go willingly to Babylon, nothing will happen to you and you'll be okay. So what did we just read? That when the captain of the guard came and was hauling people away, it said, and those that fell away, that fell to the king of Babylon, that means they surrendered. So there were people who listened to Jeremiah and listened to God and did what they were told. Hallelujah. God always has a remnant. Okay, but Nebuzaradan, verse 16, the captain of the guard, left certain of the poor of the land for vine dressers and farmers, so to work the vineyards and till the land. Also the pillars of brass that were in the house of the Lord, the bases, the brazen sea that was in the house of the Lord, the Chaldeans broke and carried all the brass with them to Babylon. The cauldrons also, the shovels, snuffers, bowls, spoons, vessels of brass, wherewith they ministered, the Chaldeans took away. So all the stuff in the, they completely looted the temple and there was no reason or excuse for them to do that. You want to mess with the people, you want to hurt the people who rebelled against you, that's fine. But you don't desecrate the temple of the God who gave you the power that you have. That is why there came a point where God put judgment on the Chaldeans, the Babylonians. And in an earlier chapter, we learned that the reason they're sometimes called the Chaldeans is because the land of the Chaldeans was the name was given the name given to Southern Babylon. So sometimes that's why that's used interchangeably. So they're just looting the whole temple. Verse 19, the basins, the fire pans, the bowls, the cauldrons, the candlesticks, the spoons, the cups, that which was of gold in gold, that which was of silver in silver, the captain of the guard took away. The two pillars, the sea, 12 brazen bowls that were under the bases that King of Solomon had made in the house of the Lord, the brass of all these vessels was without weight. There were so many of them. And concerning the pillars, the height of one pillar was 18 cubits. And um, another of 12 cubits did surround it. And the thickness thereof was four fingers and it was hollow. So um, King James is going with cubits. And cubit was a web, was, I can't even talk, a measure of weight that went from your elbow to the tip of your tallest finger. So that was a cubit. So if you want, um, if you're ever interested in learning this, you can go online and, and Google it and it'll, um, you know, work out the measurements for you and, and feet and different things like that for you to get a better understanding of it. But to start out with, one cubit is the length of approximately from your elbow to the tip of your middle finger. Verse 22 says, a chapiter of brass was upon it. And so what a chapiter is, is just the bases of the pillars. Do you know, like um, from Rome and stuff, you, you see those pillars and they're long. And then at the top and the bottom, it's like a square. It, you know, that those were the chapiters. That's what that was. Chapiter of brass was upon it. The height of one chapiter was five cubits with network. That's the lattice work. And pomegranates, Okay, and these were not real, but engraven um, embroidery work and stuff that they did in the curtains and the different things that they engraved in it. Um, 
in the curtains, it was embroidery. And then in these with the gold, it was engraved in gold. They had different things, angels engraved or embroidered, pomegranates engraved or embroidered, different designs and things. So I would have loved to have seen it. It just sounds really beautiful. So, um, so verse 22, we are in the second pillar also, and the pomegranates were like unto these. Verse 23, there were 96 pomegranates on one side, and all the pomegranates on the lattice work were a hundred all around. So that's very intricate. And the captain of the guard, Nebuzaradan, took Soraya, the chief priest, and Zephaniah, the second priest, and the three doorkeepers. He also took out of the city a eunuch that had the charge of the men of war, seven of them that were near the king's, um, that were close to the king, that were found in the city, and the main scribe of the army who mustered the people of the land. He was the one that stirred them up in rebellion against Babylon. And 60 men of the people of the land that were found hiding in the middle of the city. Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, took them all, brought them to the king of Babylon in Riblah. And the king of Babylon struck them and put them to death there in Riblah, in the land of Hamath. So Judah was carried away captive out of his own land. This is the people who Nebuchadnezzar carried away captive. So they're going to give you a list because um, you'll find out here in the list, it'll show you that the captives that he took weren't all taken at once. So it was over time they would take some. First of all, there were two major attacks um, that caused, you know, where they besieged um, Jerusalem and Judah and overtook it. But even in those two, there were different times that they would come back and get more people and haul them away. So verse 28, we were in the middle. This is the people who Nebuchadnezzar carried away captive. In the seventh year, he took 3,023 Jews. In the 18th year of his reign, he took captive from Jerusalem 832 people. Then in the 23rd year of his reign, the captain of the guard carried away captive of the Jews 700 45 people. All the people were 4,600. And it came to pass in the 37th year of the captivity of Jehoiakim, king of Judah. 37th year of his captivity. So if you remember King Jehoiakim, he was the one who was king when Nebuchadnezzar raided Judah and took it over and hauled him off to prison. So he's been in prison now for 37 years, just rotting in prison. Now you remember that the promise was that they would be captive in Babylon for 70 years. So this is 37. So this is just a little bit over halfway there. Um, and he was 18 years old when he was led away captive um, into Babylon. So this is 37 years later. <clears throat> Excuse me. So when he had been in prison in Babylon for 37 years, in the 12th month, in the 25th day of the month, it happened that they had a new king of Babylon. He was called Evil Merodach. And evil in this translation, or this the way it's written in the Hebrew, is foolish. And he was that was the name he was given because he made a lot of dumb decisions and dumb mistakes. He was the biological son to Nebuchadnezzar. So he inherited this, the throne right after him still did a lot of stupid stuff so he's the new king now evil Merodach and so it says that um, in the first year of his reign so he becomes king and he lifted up the head of Jehoiakim king of Judah and brought him out of prison and spoke kindly to him 
set his throne above the throne of the kings that were with him in Babylon, took off his prison clothes, and let him continually eat bread in his presence for the rest of his life. And for his food, there was a continual diet given to him of the king of Babylon, every day a portion till the day he died, all the days of his life. So I'm reading this and I'm like, oh my goodness, this has always um, struck me. Like, I've always wondered, like, why? He's foolish. And so why, what made him... His one of his first acts as king, he just gets to the throne. And one of his first acts as king is going into the prison and taking this king of Judah who was rebellious. And he's been sitting in this prison for 37 years, brings him out, turns his life all upside down for the better and just blesses him for the rest of his life. So I looked it up and so... Um, in Jewish thought, um, they, they do have a, th a, a thought process behind it. There's nothing written to back it up. I will tell you that. But what they believe, and it kind of, it really does make sense, is if you remember, um, and I don't know if you're familiar with this or not, but it talks about in, in Daniel, you really learn a lot more about Nebuchadnezzar and his kingdom. And uh, Daniel, through Daniel and his friends that worked in the kingdom as captives that got taken there. From Judah. And so um, you learn that there comes a point in time where Nebuchadnezzar refuses, he's filled with so much pride, and he refuses to honor God, and he has a really bad dream. And Daniel comes and tells him the interpretation of the dream, which is seven years are determined against you. And if you don't repent and give God the glory that he's the one that gave you all this stuff. He's the one that lets you prosper and become so rich and powerful. And if you don't give him the glory, he's going to take it all away from you and make you a crazy madman. And you're going to lose everything and live in the wilderness like a wild animal. And about a year went by and he wouldn't listen and wouldn't change and so that's exactly what happened to him. His kingdom was stripped away from him. He lived in the wilderness like a wild animal. All his nails grew. His All his hair grew. He just was like a crazy dude. And his mind went insane. And then at the end of seven years, it, his clarity all came back. And God restored him to his kingdom. So... What happened is in those seven years of his absence, his son, Merodach, who became known as evil, foolish Merodach, took the throne in his father's absence and just screwed up the kingdom, made just one blunder after another, was a horrid king, not wise, foolish, dumb continual decisions. And so when Nebuchadnezzar got his sanity back and restored back to the kingdom, he put his son in prison for because of just all the not just dumb decisions, but perversion of justice and government, all the crooked things he was doing. And Nebuchadnezzar wasn't having it. So he put him in prison. And so it's believed that while Merodach was in prison, he met Jehoiakim, and they were both evil. They were both bad. They both did not care about God. They both had no sense whatsoever. And so they formed a friendship and a bond. So they believe that that's why when Merodach became king, one of the first things he did was bring Jehoiakim out and set him at his table, took care of him for the rest of his life because they formed a friendship when they were in prison. So it's not written in stone. It's not in the Bible. We don't know, but that's the train of thought. So um, I want to thank you guys so much for joining me in this. And um, I hope you guys will join me in Lamentations. We'll be starting that soon. And to just um, give Jeremiah the justice he deserves 
and for his voice to be heard. So thank you so much, guys. I hope you have a wonderful night. God bless you. Bye-bye.